Good morning, everyone. It is great to see you here. Thank you for joining us online and in other rooms as well as we begin our Jonah series that will take us up, if the Lord wills, to Easter. And uh, we're looking forward to celebrating that with you as well. And uh, we're excited to start this series today because I think it's gonna resonate with a lot of folks who find themselves in a season of life where they're questioning whether they could continue on with something or whether they should continue on with something or whether maybe it's time to go. So, so they're wrestling. If, 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 should I stay? Should I go? Is this the right thing to do? Is this the wrong thing to do? And we enter into those seasons of life at different times, from whether it's a, a kid wrestling through whether they should do this or do that, whether it's a college student, should I go to this college or this college, whether you're at work, should I start my own business, should I stay in this organization, whether maybe you're even in retirement age, should I continue working or should I stop? And you're wrestling through these times in your life where you're saying, God, are you leading me to do this? Or is this me leading me to do this? Because we all like to plan out the future. In fact, we enjoy it. Some of you are big time planners. Okay. Now, now if your family members are looking at you, okay, they didn't tell me you were that. All right. But, but you're just a planner. You've got a strategic calendar, not only for this year, but for next year. And then next year, you already know where your kids are going to college, right? You're they're, they're two, right? You're done. We don't even have to figure this out. Or maybe you're figuring out just where you wanna go next or what you wanna do next. And you're a planner. Maybe you're a visionary and you come up, oh, I wanna start this. I wanna dream this up. And you love drawing on the journal. You're thinking through the different things. Maybe, maybe you're thinking how you're gonna attack this semester. And you look through the syllabus and you're like, okay, this is how I'm gonna attack this month and then this month. Or this is what's coming this summer. Some of you already have your family vacations planned out for summer. Not of 23, but 25. The book of James is gonna give us our anchor verse. We're gonna put as an umbrella up over the book of Jonah. That's gonna kind of serve as a big idea that we're gonna see weave throughout our series. It's James who says, come now, you who say. Come now, you who say. And he continues in chapter four of his great book. He says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go into such and such a city and spend a week there and make profit. Come on, you who say, I know what we'll do. We'll leave here. We'll spend this much time here. This is how we're gonna do it. And on top of that, they're successful thinkers. They're like, we're gonna make a profit. We're gonna do great. There's some of us, they make plans and they just expect good results. He goes, yeah, all you planners, all you visionaries, all you thinkers, right? Come here, what, what, what? Come here. What is your life? And you, you recoil a second. What do you mean, Pastor James? What's your life? You're but a vapor that's here and then gone. Poof, just a puff. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will do this and we will do that. You don't just go make your plans without God. You don't just move into your future without the Lord. You don't even speak that way. You don't talk that way. You don't live that way. You don't think about just yourself because what you're gonna do is gonna impact many people. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow will go into such and such a city, spend a week there and make a profit. Yet what is your life? You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes. You saying I'm not important? No, no, Jesus placed tremendous value on us he spread his arms on the cross for us. It's a position of humility in our forward thinking. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will do this and do that. But instead, you boast. And in your arrogance, all boasting is evil. But then James drops the bomb. He says this, therefore, if you know you should be planning prayerfully, if you know you should be talking humbly, and if you know you should be thinking selflessly and you fail to do it, to him it is sin. So whoever knows the right thing to do in the lunchroom at school, whoever knows the right thing to do 
on Saturday night in the car with all your friends. So whoever knows the right thing to do in that business engagement in that back room of that office, whoever knows the right thing to do in that relationship you're involved in, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, to him, it is sin. Let's use the word sins of omission. Almost like, oh man, I I didn't do something God was asking me to do. And so why wouldn't I do something that God is asking me to do? If I love God, why wouldn't I do what he's asking me to do? There can be only one reason, and that's selfishness. Where, God, am I being selfish in my planning? Where, God, am I being selfish in my talking? Where, God, am I being selfish in my thinking? For I don't want to fail to do the right thing in those moments when I'm challenged to do the right thing or the wrong thing. In this series, we're going to be talking about a man named Jonah. And we're going to be looking at this life. And many of you are familiar with the stories. If you grew up in church, you've seen the felt boards. And many of you right now are only picturing a whale. We've called sight and sound. We can't get it here yet this week. No, no, I'm I'm kidding. (laughs) But there's a prophet here who spoke for God. And it seems had been used by God in other circumstances. And now a fresh call is coming from God. He's He's not blown away that God's asking him to speak for him. But if you know the life of Jonah, he does something that's very surprising, shocking that the scriptures would even record it. He does exactly opposite what God is asking him to do. And it takes him on a journey from buying a ticket to being into the sea, to going into the belly, to speaking the message of 40 days to being asked by God himself, do you do well to feel the way you're feeling? See, Jonah's name can mean dove. But if you work through the translations at times, you can see even in that name, it can kind of sometimes refer to as silly even. And you're gonna see in this book some silly behavior at times. Now, what do you refer to when you see something as silly? You often think that's kind of immature. And you will watch this prophet behave in times very immaturely. And there's seasons in our life where God says it's time to grow up in this area. I know there's men in the room who know when God accepted, you accepted the challenge from God to say it's time to grow up financially. Oh man, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Ladies, it, it's time to grow up in this area of nurturing or in this area of business or in this area of school or in this, guys, everybody. There's times where you go, where you just feel that, that Lord going, it's time, okay? We've been having this way for a long time. It's time to go to a new season of ministry and we have a, a tendency sometimes to go, I don't want to. That sounds scary or hard or difficult. God, you know what that would mean and we battle it and it's amazing how far we're willing to go sometimes to get away from God's call in our life. And you're gonna find in this book how amazing it is about how far God is willing to come for his kids. Why? Because he loves us. That's the message of Jonah. We're gonna learn a lot in Jonah. Today, one of my goals is us to see what this prophet does, to learn from it, and learn before we make the same mistake. I wish I had this message a little bit more earlier. Like if I was in high school or college, I would appreciate having this more than even today from some of the mistakes I've made by not following after what God had been leading me to do. And maybe today we can help prevent some of that by learning from someone else's mistakes. It's a little bit more fun. 
How many of you only learn the hard way? All my stubborn, sometimes a tad bit selfish children of God, you're gonna get a great message of love as the God that we all love and serve shows us how much he loves even his most stubborn and selfish kids. Heavenly Father, thank you for how far you were willing to go for us all the way to the cross. And Lord, there's times in our lives where we are selfish and we say, I don't wanna do that. Or God, that sounds hard. Or God, you just don't understand. Or if I do that, you know I'm gonna this or that. And we come up with all these thoughts because we think we can can control the future. But come now, those who say that, and learn from the life of Jonah. God, we pray that this will be a great series as we walk through the book of Jonah. If the Lord wills, will you use this to help us think selflessly about how you look at this world? We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. To the plane, I was sure your grace ran low. I kept running and running and running. You kept chasing and chasing and chasing. great to see you today. Some of you are going, I see you rocking the glasses there, huh? Um, Somebody said to me, do you have to wear them? I said, no, I don't have to wear them. I get to wear them. Actually, I blame publishers. They keep making the font smaller, church. They keep making it smaller. Yeah, they're prescription. So until my contacts come in, you might have to deal with them. But come now, those who say, I love the book of Jonah. I'm excited about this. I think we're gonna learn a lot and glean a lot of wisdom. Plan to preach through this awesome book of antiquity in our sacred text with a literal, historical, grammatical approach to this prophetic narrative. And I think as we walk through it, we're gonna grow from, um, the life lessons that Jonah provides. And it, and it begins um, in a way that sometimes certain translations don't necessarily pick up on. In the original language, uh, all my scholars in here, New Testament, we come comes from Greek, right? Old Testament comes from Hebrew, right? And so in the Hebrew, there's a neat little thing that goes on here. Now you could say it's W-A-W is the conjunction, okay? That, that sometimes shows up, but is in the original language. And that is a vav or way. It's a, It depends on how you want to translate it, but it can mean to add, to secure, or even to hook, okay? So what is it hooking onto? What is this J hooking onto? Well, it seems to be a connection of a story that continues to grow, that whether it maybe came from something um, that was a larger collection or that is continuing to tell a story, God's story, if you will, on how he works with his children. And so you could say, and the Lord, as if we're continuing on, but what we have here in our translation today is the Lord 
gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai, okay? Here comes this message, the word of the Lord. Now he's a prophet, he speaks for God and God gives him messages to say. Now, being a prophet from God's people, Israel, he is used to speaking to the people of Israel. And he speaks and he pronounces judgments that they would lead towards repentance. I mean, anybody who studies prophets knows this is how they work. And I mean, no way would God ever ask him to preach to anybody but God's children. He would never ask him to preach to a Gentile nation or city or nothing like that. But that's exactly the next verse. God says to Jonah, his prophet, I want you to get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. That's fun to say. Nineveh, right? I mean, what if you were from Nineveh, right? That's, I mean, Percasy is kind of fun to say. Foreigners call it Percasy, right? But, but, but Nineveh, I think I watched a movie where they said Francisco, that's fun to say, right? Right, right, Nineveh, that's fun to say. And, I, and whenever I speak with teens or kids or you go to these different assemblies and stuff, you, you should hear the kids yell, Nineveh, okay? I do it just so they remember it, but it's hard to forget Nineveh. What, what's Nineveh? What do, you, what do you want us to do, God? Uh, announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. Announce judgment. God's method of bringing repentance is to announce judgment. Why should we care about this Gentile nation? I mean, they're a threat to God's people. They're evil, right? They're wicked. I mean, what do we know about this Nineveh? Because it's interesting. One comment here said, if you look at the broad brush of the book of Jonah, it's as if God's saying to Jonah, I want you to go speak judgment against it because their trouble that they're in concerns me. <laughs> Nineveh. What do you know about it? Well, it was built by Nimrod. So we know not many good things came of that. It had stunning, stunning technology for its time. It had hanging gardens. It had vegetation to feed at some 600,000 inhabitants at that time. Very, very, very large city for that time period. It had a massive arsenal. 20 foot high towers, 100 foot wide walls. It was said that three chariots could pass on the top of the wall. So massive arsenal, very protected. Doesn't it have some Jericho overtones when you hear about this? And on top of that, they were famous for something. In fact, it's interesting, as you read a little bit about the historicity of Nineveh, they were kind of known for something as if, if, if it was in modern time, they would say they were the Guinness Book of World Record holders for something. What is that? Here, here it is. They had the ability, they bragged this, they had the ability to keep someone alive the longest that they were skinning to death. Yeah, that turned on you, didn't it? They had often furniture of human skin. Do you like our new L couch? So, so wait a minute. These people are barbaric. Yeah. These people are evil. Oh, yeah. Yeah. These people are God's people, not at all. These people are a threat to us. These people are a threat to our national security. These people are a threat to my safety and security. These people are wicked. They live lifestyles that I can't agree with. I, 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 I just don't want to even associate with them. I mean, this is the type of person where if you heard the, the Lord say, look, I want you to just go and minister to them. If they don't minister to them, those people could die, go to hell, and you go, oh, well. Stinks for them. No, if you don't get down to that government office, those decision makers, they might, they might not know about the love of Jesus Christ. Too bad for them. That's the attitude here. Whoa, how, how dark you gotta be at times to not have any compassion for something. Well, well, I think to be fair to Jonah, these people are a real threat. He has some real, real issues with this. But at this point in the story, unless you already know the story, Jonah, you don't know that. You just hear this and saying, God's saying, hey, I want you to go to them. 
So what will Jonah do? Let, let's act like we don't know what he do. So we're all curious readers, okay? Okay, God said, go to Nineveh. What will you do? Here, here's what scripture says. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction. Now, now, when I was a little boy, I went to Christian Service Brigade. Did anybody ever hear of that? Well, well, in Christian Service Brigade, one of the things we would learn is the about face, okay? So we stand like soldiers. We'd stand at a 45, and they would coach up the about face. And here's what an about face was, okay? And I'll do my best, okay? All my military guys are like, this is gonna be bad. I know, I'll just do my best, okay? Don't judge me. But you take your, your foot and you plant it, okay? And you spin on it, and now you're the opposite direction, okay? Um, so, so the word of the Lord came to Jonah. I want you to go to Nineveh, and I'm gonna act this out. If you're listening on podcasts, I can't help you. Just pretend you see me spinning, okay? Here it is, here it is. I want you to go to Nineveh, and Jonah went, I'm gonna go this way. Why would he do that? Sometimes you ask those questions of scripture and you go, man, I don't know. And then sometimes scripture just tells you why. Scripture tells you why here. Let's look. To get away from the Lord. So, so in case you're like, maybe he didn't realize Tarshish was a different place than Nineveh. Maybe he didn't realize Nineveh, you know, you know now, now you're all, most of you are from the north, but if you go down south, everyone's so much kinder down there, okay? They, they even laugh at us for how wound tight we are. We got people watching in North Carolina, you're gonna laugh when I say this, but, but down in the south, it, it's more like if somebody sits at a traffic light here in Pennsylvania for more than a second. <laughs> but, but down south, you can sit maybe through a whole light. And they say, bless their heart. <laughs> they must be tired. They must have needed a bless pastor, pastor. He just, oh, it was, oh, that sermon, bless his heart, right? Which means you poor thing, right? And, and so there might be a temptation in us to say, Jonah, bless your heart, Jonah. You didn't know, no, 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 no. I'm looking at that. He went the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. Where did he go? He went down to the port. He went there of Joppa. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. See, I, I use words like that and all my Star Wars fans lean in. Joppa, that sounds good. Joppa, what, what is this Joppa? Okay, this is a port city and he's leaving for Tarshish. You know, that's kind of hard to say. Nineveh might be fun to say, but Tarshish is kind of hard to say. Where, where, where was this Tarshish? I mean, if it's not Nineveh and he wants to go to Tarshish, I mean, it, it seems to be near Spain, okay? We know Tarshish is the great grandson of Noah, okay? And so we know kind of the area where he was settled in, but Tarshish, if you've got a Nineveh, which represents everything you kind of can't stand, people groups you frustrated with, people that you don't, oh man, you don't even want to love, and in fact, you would love to see their demise. You consider them enemies. That's your Nineveh. But, but if you got a Tarshish, it's kind of a, oh, oh, I like Tarshish. We were thinking about going to Tarshish the second week of July, you might think. I mean, Tarshish. It kind of represents like a hideout, a place where you go to get away. Tarshish was an actual place, but I think sometimes we can look at it symbolically in our own lives in application form and say, man, there's places I run to when I feel scared. I mean, I know God's leading me to do that, but my bedroom feels so much safer. I know God, it might be like challenging me to take this step, but you know what? We love our town. I mean, I know God might be leading me to do this, but, but what's that place for you? That place you run to when life comes calling and says it's time to grow up, I think I'll just stay back here. I like to refer to these moments when we're tempted to go to Tarshish, which, which man, that sounds close to selfish, doesn't it? Selfish, Tarshish. When we're tempted to go there instead of do what God has for us, I call these Joppa Doc moments. You're, you're gonna have moments in your life where you find yourself on the dock at 
Joppa. What do I mean by this? You know, I remember one time being on a dock and there was this little sign as you go out into the dock, it said this, it said this, walk, don't run. I think they're at most pools, right? Most community pools. Walk, don't run. Now kids, that's just a suggestion for the other kids, right? That's not for you, right? Uh, but, but no, it, it's a walk, don't run. Why? Because it's slippery. You could fall into the water, right? So, I mean, there's a sense where that sign is there as a, a protective kind of thing. Well, on Joppa docks of life, these times in our life where we're tested with two options, choice one and choice two. What, what, what do you mean? You might have been there yourself. Have you ever had to decide between doing the right thing or the wrong thing? I had someone counsel me. They said, Chris, in your life, you're going to find this to be true. You're going to be painted sometimes two doors. One is the hard right thing. And the other is the easy wrong thing. Note two words that are not often put into that phrase. Hard and easy. Can I illustrate? Sometimes in life, you're asked to do the hard right thing that Nineveh. But you will be tempted to do the easy wrong thing. Tarshish. And which one will you choose? I can remember a time in my life where I was on this hypothetical Joppa dock, where I had to choose between the hard right thing and the easy wrong thing for my situation with my scenario, because it might not have been for someone else, because it wasn't necessarily anything wrong I was going to do or right I was going to do, but I had to decide a career path in my early 20s. We had been married for just a couple years and my wife and I both had really good jobs. We were really happy with our jobs. I was working as a loan officer at a bank and I was on the management training sign up to move forward to work more in the bank in the management area. And I had gotten some affirmation that this might be a good idea for me. In fact, even the vice president came to me at one point and he said, Chris, I want you to stop dressing for the job you have and start dressing for the job you want. And I took that as dress up, kid. Okay, so, so I did. So, so I was moving forward to that and I was trying to do that. I was excited about this. And, and my wife at that time was working at Pearl S. Buck Foundation as the president's executive assistant. So she was very happy where she was. I mean, we were in this town. We were, we were a young couple. I had a GT and she was getting ready to buy. Ready for this? Ready for this? It was all the rage back when I'm talking. She was ready to get a Volkswagen Jetta. Everybody wanted to get one, right? And, and so I'm like, yeah, hey, you can get one. We're gonna do this. I mean, we're this young couple. And we were all excited. We had this cool swaggy apartment and stuff like this. And then the opportunity comes for me to move forward possibly with what happens at the bank. And I get a call that same week from our pastor here saying, would you consider being our youth intern and working with the middle schoolers? Hmm. Go back to my home church, which I don't have the greatest testimony at. I'm shocked my youth pastor even wants me back. Or move forward with a pretty secure situation financially, future, kind of respect and all these things. And like, what, what do I do here? I know I went into college for that, but um, this sounds pretty good. Neither are necessarily wrong, but for one, it was the right thing for me. And the other, it was the wrong thing. And I, I knew that because... God was leading me on that job of doc for what I was supposed to do. I took that youth internship job. We moved into a parsonage with green, lime green carpet. But Becca was working, so we were okay, even though I was gonna take significantly different amount. And then Becca told me, we've got a little boy coming, and then we ended up draining a lot of that savings as we continued forward to what God had for us. And I'll tell you what, it was the hard right thing versus the easier wrong thing for me, not for others. 
But I'm so glad I had the advice of my father in that moment where I was on that Joppa dock. My dad said, and I, I repeat this, and I give this information out. I believe if wisdom speaks into your life, you should share it with others. He said this, remember this, Chris. The devil entices, the shepherd leads. Always remember that. And you will find the devil knows that God owns a cattle on a thousand hills, but he often will offer a couple garages to get you distracted. And I, and I was thinking through that. I was like, mm, what do I do here? And obviously uh, it has kind of worked out. But I remember that job of doc. You might be on this. Maybe you're a college student. You're like, do I, do I just, man, I am so sick of this school. I need to get out of here. Or maybe, oh, my job is so hard. Maybe you're in work and my job, I can't stand my job anymore. I mean, I liked it, but now I'm just thinking I got to get out of here. Or, or maybe, maybe God's calling you to do something. You go, no, God, I can't do that. You know me. I'm not the guy. You need to use somebody else. And you're on that job of talk. What do you do? What will Jonah do? Will Jonah continue on to selfish, I mean Tarshish? Or will he go to Nineveh? Scripture says he, he bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to selfish, I, I mean Tarshish. Isn't it often we're only thinking of ourselves? Self-preservation. I can't go to Nineveh, it's dangerous. It's dangerous, Lord, you don't want me to be dangerous. I can't go to Nineveh. Those people will reject me. Are, are these the thoughts? In fact, what's neat is we know what Jonah's thinking. We find out in a few more chapters. But what goes through our mind when we're thinking about just ourselves? Self-gratification, self-preservation. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do this. We're gonna go hide in the middle of the world where nobody can find us. What if we all chose to hide from God's call in our life? Guys, he bought a ticket, and remember this, it will always cost you something when you don't follow after what God has for you. You're always going to end up paying some kind of fare. And Jonah buys the ticket, and he heads to Tarshish. How many of you enjoy when we do a little bit of a geographical look? It kind of gives your eyes a little bit of a map. Let me show you a map of Tarshish, just in case you're like, bless his heart, he probably just got the wrong port, Chris. Watch, watch where Tarshish is, okay? Okay, 2,500 miles, okay? In fact, many believe this was the farthest destination they knew of. Guys, guys, this is like, this is like me saying, hey, I'd love to talk to you after church in the West Foyer. And church ends, and I see you go out the East Foyer. There is, there is some definite relationship change going on here. But on top of that, there's something neat here. I want us to bring, a, bring around a, an interesting thought I think you might enjoy. At that time, it was a very polytheistic thinking throughout those nations where they believed there were gods of territory. There were gods of that nation and that nation. There were gods of territory. And this is really, this is really neat. You'll like this. When, when you study the Psalms, you see David as they're gaining progressive revelation about God, sharing that God is the God of the whole earth. That's like a, whoa, he's not a God of just that area. He's not a God of this area. He's the God of the whole earth. That's why you read the Psalms. You're like, well, we all know that. Well, yeah, you do, 21st century believer. But they were going, wow, God is the God. There is nowhere I can go. Where can I go? Where can I flee from your presence? If I even go down into Sheol, God, you're there. Is it possible, Jonah, thinking a little more polytheistic because of his environment goes, maybe if I get out of this area, I'll escape God. It's a geographical move, but it's also a relational move. Have you ever had somebody purposely walk out on you? Have you ever had somebody you loved, just go the other direction? And who could possibly understand what it feels like to have someone you love totally walk the other way? I think God does. I think he understands. Because how often do we do that to him? We go, 
that's what you got for me, God. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my ball and go home. What does God do? I'll tell you what, don't in some of our humanness, you know, you know what? If, you're gonna, if he's gonna abandon you, God, let him go. Let him sail. Have a good trip, buddy. Woo, right? I mean, if some of us were God, be like, look, 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 if you wanna do, hey, get out of here. Go, enjoy yourself. I mean, how much does God have to love his boy, Jonah, to do what he's about to do? Because Jonah doesn't deserve it. He's being a little bit silly. He's being a little bit selfish. For much of his reason to run from Nineveh is he anticipates success there when he speaks. They're going to all turn to God probably. I, I got a feeling Jonah was an amazing speaker. I got a feeling he was an incredible communicator because he anticipated success. We find out in the later chapters, if I go to Nineveh, they're all gonna turn back to God because God uses me in massive ways. In fact, they do it in a couple days. The message is so powerful on top of the fact I think he looked a little different. This Jonah is behaving in a way that many of us would say, if you wanna be immature, keep going. But that's not your God. That's not the God of the Bible. Actually, it might be a God you've created, but that's not the God of the Bible. He loves even his most selfish stinkers who want to do things their way in their timing. But trust me, if you run from God, there is ramifications. Could you please, young person, could you please learn from Jonah? If you're older, and you've already experienced some of this, watch what this looks like. You might have seen this play out in your life in those moments where you said no to God. You knew the right thing to do. There was one preacher I heard, he said, we, we don't slip into sin like we say, or I didn't even see it coming. We walk in sometimes with our eyes wide open. We know it's the wrong thing to do, yet we click on it anyway. We know it's the wrong thing to think, but we think it anyway. We know it's the wrong thing to say, but we say it anyway. We know it's the wrong thing to buy, but we buy it anyway. We know it's the wrong thing to cheat, but we cheat anyway. We know it's the wrong thing, and we do it anyway. Are there ramifications? You bet there are. Does God love us anyway in his grace, child of God? You bet he does. But there's four things I want you to see that happens to those who run from God. Let's learn from Jonah. Here's the first one. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. We get an idea of hurling it upon the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. I want you to understand something. When you run from what God is asking you to do, expect distress. Oh, no, 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 Chris, Tarshish, it's, it's sandals and flip-flops. Expect distress. Sometimes when we get all worked up and frustrated about how hard something is, we think there's greener pastures on the other side. We'll burn bridges, we'll burn relationships just to get to that dream. Oh, and we think Tarshish is gonna be great. Oh, it's so wonderful there. The boss, every time I walk in in this new organization, he's gonna be like, I love you, I can't even believe you came in. You go, Chris, you're robbing my afternoons. This is all I do to get through the day is dream of other places. But that's part of the enemy. You gotta understand something. If God's called you to hard and you run from it, expect distress. Here's what happened. The mariners, the mariners, they, they, they were afraid and each cried out to his God. There's that polytheistic view, right? They all got different gods different, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But when you run from God, there's fallout. The mariners are afraid. They're throwing cargo over. See, when we run from God, we're being selfish. We don't even think about all the people it might affect. You don't think there's somebody in Tarshish waiting for some of that cargo that they might desperately need? Maybe even they were going, God, we need that cargo to get here. And because of Jonah's selfishness, stuff is falling out. Other people get hurt when God's kids Run from God. There might be a reason teenager mom cries every night. Because she's part of the fallout. There might be a reason, dad, they're all behaving that way. They're part of a fallout. There might be a reason everyone at work doesn't want to talk to you. There might be part of the fallout. Because when we think selfishly, other things get affected. 
But Jonah had gone down into the inner part. He don't care about anybody else. He's down in the inner part of the ship and he had laid down and he was fast asleep. I've heard, I've heard people say, how can he be sleeping when you're running from God? You would think he'd be full of anxiety. Did you see how far his trek was? This guy's exhausted. And when you run from God, there's exhaustion. Oh no, when, if I could just get out of this situation right now, Chris, you know how happy and all restful I'm gonna be? No, no, actually expect exhaustion. Expect isolation. When we're running from God, the enemy goes, isn't church stupid? Aren't people at church such hypocrites? He wants you as isolated as possible. Isn't that a shame your wife doesn't understand what you do? He wants you as isolated as possible. Isn't it a shame he doesn't get how wonderful a wife you are? He wants you as isolated as possible. Isn't it a shame how dumb your parents are? He wants you as isolated as possible. When you're running from God, expect isolation. And then fourth, the captain said to him, goes and finds Jonah. What do you mean, you sleeper? You could also translate that. What are you doing sleeping? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give you a thought to us that we may not perish. Come on, we're all calling out to our gods. One of the gods is upset. There's clearly this storm is for us. Call out to your God, Jonah. And maybe, maybe he's the God that's mad and he'll re- relent when you Run from God, expect the people around you to be confused at your behavior. Expect to be asked a lot of questions. Why are you all asking me all these questions? What are you doing? I I can stop this whenever I want to. I, I can stop. Expect confusion. Expect people coming. Because if you're one of God's kids, he sometimes uses discipline even difficulties to get our attention. I noted down four things. When I run from God, I should expect distress. When I run from God's plan for me, I should expect fallout. When I run from God's plan for me, I should expect isolation. When I run from God, I should expect confusion. And that's funny because when I daydream about my Tarshish, it's a place of rest and no stress and complete fulfillment and all wonderful. But you've heard the phrase a million times. There is no greener grass. Everywhere you go, there you are. You bring with you every environment. And oftentimes God doesn't want to change your environment. He wants to change your soul. I want two questions to come up on the screen in a second. And as a child of God, if you haven't ever accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, you can just listen in for a minute. It's the greatest relationship and greatest decision all us God kids have made. But there's a question, God's kids, we gotta get right. Teenager, you gotta get this right. You can't depend on mommy, daddy faith with this one, okay? College student, you gotta get this right. You've gotta know this because the devil is gonna use circumstances in your life to help you define what you think God is. And you have to know this. Do you have the answer to these two questions? And here they they are. Is God coming after Jonah or coming after you, child of God, because he hates you? Or is he God coming after you because he loves you? Because you might look at that and go, why does God allow stress? Let the guy go. I mean, good grief, God. Nineveh is horrible. I mean, after all, he makes some good points. I mean, why is God do that? Why all these things? I mean, is God coming after Jonah because he hates Jonah or because he loves Jonah? I've used this illustration before. We, we had a, a little one in the house, okay? And, and I won't use their names. But we had a stove upstairs, okay? And it was a nice black stove and it would get hot, but it had a lot of safety features. So if you touched it, it you, you wouldn't get burned. But downstairs, we had a wood stove. Hello they get really hot and they can burn the kids, okay? And so we had to teach the upstairs stove just in case they were ever downstairs and not in our, I mean, parents, right? We always have an eye on them, right? They never get away. Okay, so we were just like, in case they do, we wanted to teach it. And we had one who would like to go up to the stove and we knew that black stove would be replaced at some day with a smaller black stove. So he he come up, oh, oh, I mean, we're not naming anybody. And, and, And they come up and we would go, no, don't do that. Now, why? Because we hate him? Because we don't like him? Why would we say no? Because we love them. 
We love those kids. And he would go, ah, no, 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 no. Stop, turn around. We say, don't, don't touch the stove. And we would see this. We would see this. Did anybody have to raise one of these? What are you doing? What is that? The right arm starts going up. Don't you? They look, they look at you straight and they get this face. You're going to touch it. You're going to. Unbelievable. And then you say things like, look at your son, right? It's not, it's not. <laughs> Guys, we ran up and said, don't. And when God says don't, he means don't hurt yourself. I love you too much. There's something we like to say. It's not original to our church, but we like to use it. Sin will always do three things. It's always going to do three things. Sin will always, always cost you more than you wanted to pay. Oh, we just thought if we cheat the system right here and then we're still, I've really noticed in my life, I've actually, sin will cost you more than you wanted to pay. Sin will always do this. It will always keep you longer than you wanted to stay. Sin will keep you longer than you want to say. I mean, I, we were just hanging out in the basement and then before you know it, I didn't realize it was that late and then we made a couple bad decisions. Sin will always keep you longer than you wanted to stay. I can stop anytime. You have no idea. I'm totally controlled. I, I, I can stop anytime. Seven years later, 10 years later, 15 years later. I can stop any, anytime. Sin will always keep you longer than you wanted to stay. And, and sin will always take you way farther than you wanted to go. And Jonah is about to go on the trip of his life. Why? Because God hates him? No, because God loves him too much to allow his stubborn heart to get away. I am so grateful that God loves this stubborn heart. And if you're like me and you can be a little stubborn, Aren't you glad that God keeps coming for you even when you're being selfish? I do. But how far are you gonna go? I mean, ask yourself, how far are you gonna go? How long is this trip gonna take, child of God? How long are you gonna do this? Because I can promise you, there's gonna be distress. There's gonna be fallout, Dad. There's going to be distress, mom. There's going to be times of confusion, teenager, that you could possibly avoid if you make the choice on that dock to do the hard right thing instead of the easy wrong thing. Now, they say we're in a time period called the great resignation, that people are just leaving stuff like crazy right now, okay? I was reading an article about this, and it's just like this epidemic in society of just, I'm getting out of here, I'm doing something else, I got to shop. And some of it might have been, we, we were confined for a time period, and we started thinking, do I really want to do this with the rest of my life? And, and during those times, you find yourself on Joppa docks. Is it time for me to go? Do I want to quit or have I reached the end of a season? Is burnout talking or is that you, God? And we go back and forth, right? And we think, oh, I'm not sure what this is. Can I encourage you on your dock in case you're on one this week or right now? I want to encourage you this phrase. Please, please, when you're considering, should I go or should I stay? This phrase, walk, don't run. What? Walk away, don't run away. Because sometimes, have you ever noticed this? Who's lived life long enough to know sometimes Tarshish is actually where you are. It's not something you're running to. You have chosen the easy wrong thing, and you know God is calling you to say, hey, come on, it's time. It's time. We've reached the end of the season. Well done, thy good and faithful. Let's go. Is that you, Lord? Or is it, ooh, that, that job sounds enticing and exciting, and I hate this one. I can't stand the people. The hours are annoying. I mean, what is it? How do I make that decision? Can I leave you with 
a few thoughts for application since I referenced it. Maybe our small groups can hash it out a little bit, okay? This isn't the Bible. These are just some thoughts of wisdom for you to think through in the regards of walk, don't run. Don't run from something you're currently doing because, ready? You feel it's just too difficult. There are seasons in your life where you're called to do difficult things and God will give you the strength to do it. There are things that are too difficult, but don't run because. Don't make that your reason. You might be saying, I want to quit, but don't run because you feel hurt or underappreciated. Wherever you go, whatever you think your Tarshish is, you are going to be hurt and underappreciated again. So don't make that your reasoning. Work through the wound before you run. Third, don't run because you feel unhappy in your environment. We sometimes can buy into the lie that God wants us to be happy all the time. God sometimes just wants to grow us in holiness, not happiness. And sometimes that's a difficult environment. You love your New Testament. You love Ephesians, Philippians. They were all written in a jail. Don't run just because the environment is difficult. God might be growing your holiness. Don't don't run on that Joppa dock because you feel embarrassed by your performance. You'll make mistakes at times. And I know you might think, oh, if I just don't go back to work on Monday, I'm gonna get away from this. No, no, no. Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we do underperform and we gotta admit that, even ask for apologies at times. But that's not a reason to run because we're embarrassed by our performance. God loves us despite that. Don't run because you're afraid of mounting pressure. Oh, I think they're gonna ask me to do this and then I'm gonna see this and I could see in the next three years, this is gonna happen. Come now, you who say, you know what's gonna happen tomorrow. And then don't run because you feel a desire to hurt others on the way out. There's often a temptation. You know what? This will really stick it to them. You know what? If I do it this way, this is, that's, that's, that's not God leading you. That's the devil enticing you. You know what? If I leave like this, they'll really, they'll appreciate what I've done here. That, that's, that's not the time. That's not the time. And burnout and exhaustion and people hurting your feelings and the job's getting difficult, all those things are really sad. But the Lord can help you through those moments. But there are some times to walk away. Don't run, but walk. Walk, but only after you know you've lost your vision for where you're at. It's just you don't have fresh vision. Walk, but only after you know there's a good replacement. Moses understood to raise up a Joshua. The responsible thing that God would want you to do is raise up a replacement. Why? Because it's selfless. When you're tempted to run, you will find all your reasonings have to do with yourself. When you walk, you think about others. Don't leave until you know wise counsel would agree. And they affirm you, yes, I think this actually is the right season. I think this is the right move hearing this. But make sure you find people who tell you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. For many people surround themselves with only people who tell them what they want to hear. Find somebody who loves you enough that will tell you what you need to hear. Walk, but only after you know your input's no longer valued. Because you might be standing for something that needs to be stood for. But when you find you have gone and done everything you can, and it's simply not something that everyone is moving on, it might be time to say, my input now is no longer valuable here. Walk, but only after you know you're being led elsewhere. Sometimes we can just dream about running. It has nothing to do about where we're going. We're just trying to get away. Don't let the enemy entice. Let the shepherd lead. And then finally, walk. But only after you know you have a selfless exit strategy. If I leave in this time, in this way, in this thing, that would be best for everyone involved. Why? Well, there might be precious cargo on board and I don't want to upset it. Why? Because other people are involved in my life. Why? Because I want to follow the shepherd not be enticed. This series, we're gonna be talking about how far are we willing to go 
for someone we might not necessarily like, love, or have an affection for. And we're gonna find out how far our heavenly father is willing to go for us. And that while we were yet sinners, he stretched his arms out this wide, this far, and said, he's willing to die for us. And he asks us to love who he loves. Jonah, I'm concerned about Nineveh. Go speak to them. How far will we go?